So welcome everyone to the first session of the panel, uh, Care as Act of Transgression. Um, thank you uh, to the presenters that send their papers. We, we are very happy and glad to, to have you here. Um, a quick round of introduction. Uh, my name is Letizia Bonanno. Um, uh, ESRC postdoctoral fellow in social anthropology at University of Kent. Um, I'm currently working of my, on my research project, Reconfigurations of Care Under Austerity, which mainly draws on my doctoral research, which basically looked at the process of uh, reconfiguration of modes of care in austerity bound and patents and specifically it explores the process of pharmaceuticalization of care. Um, with me today, it's a great pleasure to have my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Ahmad Moradi. He's a postdoctoral fellow of uh, the Free University of Berlin, where he's working on um, his monograph, which draws again on uh, his doctoral research that he conducted in Iran, um, working as well on issues of care and state uh, with particular attention to the work of the Revolutionary Guard in uh, Tehran. Uh, unfortunately, she, we are not sure if she will manage to be here with us, but anyway, uh, we have the great pleasure and honor to have um, Professor Tatiana Thielen from the University of Vienna. She's a, an anthropologist and she has extensively worked on issues of care and definitely pushed forward the conversation about kinship and the state. We, we have to say that our work has proved of great inspiration to, to draft uh, the call for this, uh, for this panel. So we are very, very glad and excited to have this chance to, to work with her. So that's, um, that's us. And again, thanks for joining uh, the panel. Uh, before we start, uh, I guess uh, we need to do a bit of housekeeping. So I'm gonna briefly tell you how the sessions are gonna be structured and basically what's gonna happen. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, maybe this is a bit obvious, but we will ask you to mute yourself and then we'll, we will ask you to unmute yourself in due time for your presentation. And before you start uh, presenting your work, uh, it would be nice uh, if you could introduce yourself and your affiliation just to, uh, to associate names and work and faces. That, that's very nice and must be nice. Um, what else? Um, in this uh, first session, Ahmad will act as a moderator, so basically he will monitor the, the chat. If you have questions or if you want to share comments and thoughts, please feel free to use the chat. And as well, raise your hand uh, if you have questions or you want to make a comment or anything. Everyone is welcome to uh, to share the, their thoughts and, and comments. So uh, we will proceed to listening to all the presentations and at the end of which uh, Tatiana or perhaps Ahmad uh, will read the comments that Tatiana has uh, shared with us and we are sure that they will help to uh, boost further uh, this conversation that we find, I mean, we're really excited about. Um, just a very few words about uh, the birth, let's say, of this panel, uh, what kind of engagement uh, we had uh, with the available literature on care and basically how we came up uh, with this idea of care as an act of transgression. So as I mentioned, just uh, few seconds ago, um, Tatiana's work has been really inspirational and especially um, her take on this very artificial separation between kinship and the state, which, I mean, has proved uh, rather uh, fragile. And somehow we think that uh, the missing link uh, between this 
these two institutions is actually care. And once we embrace this idea that care is a set of shifting practice that moves between kinship, family, and state institutions, we can also somehow go beyond this idea that the family or kinship is what or yeah, what provides good care, whereas the state is the uh, agent of this regard. Uh, we know from literature, anthropological scholarship that uh, in any form of, form of care, there's a degree of violence or transgressions of rule. And in this sense, I'm, I'm thinking about the very recent work by um, Shabha Varma, the occupied clinic, but we can go a bit uh, back in time and think about Vina Das or Joao Biel and all these people that start engaging and discussing and criticizing this artificial separation between kinship and the state when it comes to, to care. Um, as you are obviously aware, uh, care is a rather elusive concept as being uh, broadly theorized and it's very flexible and in a sense this flexibility and this elusiveness um, grants space and margins to explore this concept ethnographically and I think like the the, the best part very um, interesting um, the most interesting side is that all the presenters uh, wrote deeply ethnographic papers that provided uh, new and novel insights into this practice of care and how care, again, entails a negative disposition um, and it's not necessarily uh, good, it's not necessarily a moral good. So uh, perhaps this was a rather obvious and definitely superficial introduction to the to the panel, but yeah, we just felt like sharing a bit our ideas on uh, on what care and transgression and violence um, mean or can be analyzed um, ethnographically. Uh, so the first presenter for this uh, session is a uh, Siak van der Geest, who is unfortunately uh, is not present today. is uh, celebrating his birthday, but he kindly shared with us um, a video presentation that Hakmat is gonna uh, play uh, with us. So let's get started, and thanks again for for being online with us. Well, it's a great uh, pleasure to give the stage and the floor to Julia. Uh, please, Julia. Um, yes, thank looking you. forward to your presentation. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much, Letizia and Ahmad, for putting this panel together. Really happy to be here. Um, so I'm Julia Scholli, and I'm completing my PhD in social anthropology uh, at the University of Cambridge. Um, and for my PhD, I uh, explored practices of care in a public treatment center for eating disorders in, in central Italy. And my work is at the intersection between the anthropology of science and biomedicine and the anthropology of care and kinship. And so this panel is really, really interesting and helpful to me. And um, as Letizia also said, what I'm going to present is really pretty much just ethnography and, and some reflections on um, these themes that I've just uh, recently started uh, thinking about. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to um, hear your um, feedback and, and questions. And I'm just going to, uh, I don't have slides, I'm just going to uh, read my paper. So if you prefer to stop staring at the screen, just feel free to, to listen. Um, okay. So um, it is a Thursday morning in mid, in mid November 2019. As I walk in the semi residential facility of the Eating Disorder Treatment Center, where I've been conducting fieldwork for the past months, the corridors appear quieter than usual. I find the dietitian Marta sitting alone in the front office. She greets me without her usual smile. Have you heard what happened yesterday evening? I shake my head. 
I had spent the previous evening in the residential facility located 10 minutes away, but no news had reached me. Marta tells me that a patient, Lisa, had tried to jump out of a window from the third floor of the building. Luckily, she had been found still standing on the ledge of the window by two other patients, who had promptly pulled her down. She was now sleeping in the relaxation room, with her therapist checking on her. In the meantime, the psychotherapist Valeria was holding an emergency group session for the other patients, who, in Marta's words, needed to be reassembled a bit. Lisa was 27, had a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa and was said to show depressive traits. However, she had never given any reason to suspect that she could attempt a gesture like that, professionals kept insisting while trying to make sense of what had happened. Later that day, during the staff meeting, they were struggling to decide what to do. Valeria insisted for Lisa to be discharged immediately and then be admitted to a different facility. She shouldn't stay here after what she did, both for her sake and for that of others. We can't just pretend that nothing happened. She did something serious and she broke the therapeutic contract. We can't keep her here with this risk. She should be here when she could be watched 24 seven. The clinical director disagreed. Sending Lisa away would be experienced by her as an explosive act, she held. She recommended to keep Lisa under their care and make her work on what had happened. Lisa's breach of one of the key rules of the therapeutic contract, avoiding self-harming acts, was therefore also seen as a cry for help that should be responded to with more care. Refusing her this care was judged by the clinical director to be potentially more dangerous for Lisa than staying in a facility that did not have the resources to monitor her constantly. Rules can therefore be banned for the sake of care, it seems. I've opened the paper with an example of extreme rule breaking, but as we will see in the following sections, extreme acts are not the only kind of rule breaking that generate quandaries and conflicting responses among professionals. In what follows, I first set the stage by introducing the apparatus of rules that shape patients stay in the treatment center. I then analyze the cases of two patients whose persistent everyday transgressions of those rules far from being simply acts that boycott treatment and make them risk treatment discharge, are generative of more care. At the same time, we will see these acts require the treatment team to themselves break the rules, often with double-edged consequences. Most patients diagnosed with an eating disorder are not admitted to a treatment facility out of their own will. Patients are often brought to treatment by someone else who manages with considerable effort to convince them to be admitted on the ground that they are risking their lives. Yet on admission, patients are asked to sign a therapeutic contract indicating that they agree to collaborate with treatment. The contract establishes their rights and responsibilities and includes respecting a long list of rules, compulsory behaviors, compulsory participation to the group activities, completing their meals, avoiding purging and other compensatory behaviors like constantly moving and exercising, avoiding self-harming behaviors, avoiding alcohol, drugs, laxative, diuretics, and so on. However, patients are not expected to observe all the rules from the first day of admission. That would be impossible, professionals explain, or else they would not be in need of treatment. Rules thus function as an ideal to which patients must strive for, as pointed out by the clinical director. In fact, she remarked, the contract has mostly a symbolic function. Nevertheless, sustained dismissal of the rules over time results in the treatment team questioning the patient's motivation for treatment and into a week's pause for reflection, which could lead to discharge. This is done on the ground that the waiting list for this public service is long and that if a patient is not motivated enough, her spot could be better used for someone else. Anthropological accounts of eating disorder treatment have mostly framed the rules of treatment as something that is paradoxically detrimental to patients. Gremillions and Warren's ethnographies of eating disorder units in the US and in Australia, for example, have usually highlighted how the strictly regulated settings and dynamics of surveillance that they observed unwittingly reproduce the very dynamics that sustain eating disorders, making treatment fail. Rules were based, they suggested, on the same notion of patient self as lacking in self-discipline that is seen to be at the basis of the eating disorder symptomatology, and therefore unwittingly functioned as the opposite of care. 
In what follows, instead, I look at the generative potential of rules and argue that their potential to generate care resides precisely in rule breaking. Katia was a 19 year old girl from a large city in central Italy who had been diagnosed with anorexia when she was 13. Her psychiatrist had informed the clinical director that nobody else had managed to treat her successfully. After several attempts with outpatient treatment, countless hospital admissions and the residential treatments in other parts of Italy, Katia's main problem was seen to have roots in a highly symbiotic relationship with her mother. Two days after admission, Katia tried to escape and became so resistant to staying in the facility that the only way the clinical director could convince her not to self-discharge was to allow her to stay from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. only. At that point, she would be allowed to go home with her mother. At 4 p.m., an intern or a volunteer would go to her house and stay until 9 p.m., making sure that Katia ate her afternoon snack at dinner and that she did not spend time walking around town. This arrangement, I was told by professionals, was unprecedented and beyond any regulation. The clinical director, however, explained it as the only possible option to try and still care for Katia in some ways. Bending the rules was seen to be a better option than losing the patient entirely by self-discharge. The standard rules are seen not to fit this exceptionally complicated case here. Fully respecting the ru those rules would, again, amount to abandonment in the, in the eyes of the director. All the volunteers kept reporting that it was proving impossible to make Katya eat what she was supposed to eat and when she was supposed to eat in that setting. It also seemed impossible to prevent her from leaving the house and walking around town without generating a full-blown crisis in which she would start hitting her mother. The reasons for things not working was ascribed to the fact that Katya's mother let her do whatever she wanted and that by breaking the rules of residential treatment, the clinical director was now doing the same. We see here how all the actors in the network of care break some rules. The patient not respecting the agreed portions, the timing of meals and the ban on walking around town, the family carer letting her daughter break the rules, ignoring professionals' recommendations, and the professionals bending the rules of residential treatment not to lose a patient. Yet, in this case, rule breaking is heavily criticized by the treatment team. We see the decision of the director as entirely counterproductive, even if with caring intentions. In the next and final section instead, we see an instance in which due to the prolonged length of admission, the whole treatment team find itself enmeshed in a routinized rule breaking, which becomes, so to speak, the rule. Maya was a 33 year old patient from a small town nearby. She had been diagnosed with anorexia when she was 15 and had been in and out of the facility for the last 10 years. From the first days, it became evident that Maya was a special patient. The first notable aspect was that Maya always had a personal assistant sitting next to her for the whole duration of the meal. The staff explained that Maya had herself requested that so that she could be watched second by second. The other notable difference was her absence from shared spaces. Patients were supposed to spend as little time as possible alone in their rooms and were often called if they failed to show up in the living room. Maya, however, seemed to be exempted. Similarly, she seemed to be exempted from participating to the otherwise compulsory group activities. A few months into my fieldwork, after having been stable at an already very low weight for a long time, Maya started losing more weight. Notwithstanding the personal assistant, professionals kept finding bread crumbles and tomato sauce under her chair after meals. However, they agreed that this could not possibly be enough for her to lose so much weight, considering the high calorie meal plan she had. The main suspect was instead located in her hyperactivity, in the fact that whenever she was not watched, she would constantly move this way, burning calories. Volunteers reported to have seen her walking up and down the stairs located in the bedroom area, while the other patients were in the living room or participated to group activities. Professionals doing night shifts suspected that she spent most of the nights walking in her bedroom. The treatment team was aware that they were treating Maya differently from other patients. Rules don't exist for her anymore. We are so exasperated with her that we have stopped trying. It's as if we take it for granted now that she doesn't participate to group activities. Many members of the team felt that Maya should be sent to a different facility because they were unable to help her. 
She's become one of us, so we just can't make her respect the rules. What Maya needed, most professionals held, was to be admitted to a facility where nobody knew her. Only this way, it was felt, could she be treated as strictly as any other patient and could get better. Others, however, found the mere idea unthinkable for the same reason. We can't send her away in such a difficult situation. We are the only meaningful relationship she has. She would feel abandoned. It took weeks of discussions for Maya to be eventually sent to a different facility. The clinical director knew well the treatment team there, as the two facilities had been collaborating for a while, but the other team had not met Maya before, and that was seen to be enough. She respect the rules there, everyone hoped. We have seen that in this treatment center, patients' rule breaking is not simply a way to boycott treatment, but also a way to ask for help and elicit more care. Sometimes this extra care requires professionals to bend the rules themselves, a kind of unruly care that is often framed as inevitable as an inevitable step to provide good care and avoid neglecting patients. Yet, as the two cases I analyze suggest, this unruly care is difficult and slippery work. It is hard for professionals to draw the line between helping the patient and colluding with the eating disorder. Finally, in some instances, the care that patients through breaking calls for seems to be a kind of care that consists of more rules, rules that only a different carer might be able to provide. Thank you. Thanks, Julia, for the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so now we move on to our next uh, presenter, uh, Carrie. Um, if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. Um, okay, so thank you to um, the panel um, conveners for organizing this really interesting panel. Um, so I'm just going to get straight into it for the um, purposes of time. Um, so this paper that I'm going to be discussing today um, is based on key um, doctoral findings from uh, key findings from my doctoral field work, which I conducted between 2014 and 2015, in which I undertook an ethnography of community based learning disability support services in the area of England. And um, just in case people aren't aware, I'm just going to give you a brief description of learning disability. So um, the UK Department of Health defines learning disability as a significantly reduced ability to understand new or complex information, to learn new skills with a reduced ability to cope independently, which started before um, adulthood. And importantly, um, this is not to be confused with the use of learning difficulties um, such as dyslexia. It's a completely different um, condition. Um, at the outset, this doctoral research focused on exploring how um, government policy is experienced in everyday learning disability support settings. And I was particularly interested in understanding the tension created when policies that pr promote aspirations of choice and independence are played out in the lives of people whose condition can mean that they're inherently reliant on others for support, such as people with learning disabilities. Um, however, um, a, a key finding that came out of um, this research that I'm going to focus on today because it holds relevance for this panel um, relates to professional boundaries that are put in place in support settings. And these professional boundaries are put in place to safeguard from harm both people with learning disabilities, so people in receipt of support, as well as the staff who support them. Um, um, in the UK, um, safeguarding policies are governed by um, legislation known as the CARE Act, which was put in place in 2014. And this recognises the need to protect vulnerable people living in full-time social care um, support settings from risks, including abuse, bad treatment, neglect or exploitation of any kind. Hence, if boundaries between staff and people receiving support are made professional, the idea is that if they're more transactional, or even emotionally distanced, there is less perceived chance that these forms of harm can occur. And this is in recognition, of course, of how the space of care and support in which intimate, counters, intimate encounters take place can render individuals, both those giving and receiving care, um, varyingly exposed in ways just described. 
Um, in, in addition to this, um, liberal values of um, autonomy and equality underpin the Care Act. So, for instance, um, relationships perceived to be paternal, which could come, up, could come about as a result of friendships between staff and people being supported, for example, are viewed in this context as inappropriate, being too close to the parent-child dynamic and so patronising and positioning people in receipt of support as passive recipients. <clears throat> Um, so the issue of this idea of professional boundaries came into play throughout my fieldwork, as I regularly observed how many of the people with learning disabilities with whom I spent time were often eager to be socially connected with those around them, and how support staff were often the object of their attention, um, usually through requests for physical and or emotional engagement. However, because of the professional boundary rules, staff were often put in the position of having to refuse such invitations from people they supported. And I saw often firsthand how this appeared to leave people with learning disabilities, feeling lonely and socially disconnected in their lives. Today, I'm going to present some ethnographic vignettes taken from my doctoral fieldwork that elucidate the complex issues and tensions at play with regard to support, how support staff navigated the professional boundaries and formal care settings that seek to contain care relationships within transactional encounters. So, for example, including whether or not staff would transgress these boundaries. Um, in situations um, that may be for an example of which is um, to accept invitations to be hugged or whether they would quickly move their hands away when somebody with a learning disability tried to take it, tried to hold it. Um, in doing so, I hope to respond to the focus of this panel, um, which is speaking to how rules and their transgressions shape relations of care. In this, I also want to pose the question of whether it is possible to safely and transparently incorporate elements of physical and or emotional connections into the everyday practice of learning disability support. So the setting, um, Fieldwork was undertaken at an organisation I've called Signatory Trust, which was a registered tra charity based in an area of England providing housing and day service support for adults with learning disabilities. Organisational policy at Signatory Trust mirrored um, expectations of the Care Acts that I've just described, um, instructing support workers to maintain these professional boundaries with the people they're supporting. The ethnographic material I present here, uh, based on encounters with people with learning disabilities and support staff, um, working in supporting in, sorry, working in as a supported living, so as a care home, um, that was part of um, Singatory Trust. And I have called this um, uh, home that they were based in um, Sanders Third View. Um, here there lived three young men, Mark, Joey and Sam, who were in their mid-twenties and defined as having mild to moderate learning disabilities with no physical disabilities. The level of their disability was such that these three young men needed full-time support from staff who worked shifts with at least one staff member always present day and night. However, each of the men did have some form of voluntary work or engage in some form of voluntary work and they regularly attended various learning disability services such as community farms and day centres. There to entertain, not to support. Sorry, that's the wrong way around. There to support, not to entertain. Um, Despite organisational policy around professional boundaries and despite support workers and other staff members appearing to make efforts to uh, maintain professional boundaries with people they supported, after only a short time in the field, it became evident that these boundaries were difficult to maintain. During one house meeting at Sunderset View, the care home uh, I'm referring to, um, at which I had been present, the discussion indicated that support workers could experience difficulties in, in encouraging the young men living there to agree to help out with contributing to the running of the house. So, for example, things like food shopping, which needed to be done later that day. Support workers who were in the meeting, Emily and David, told the young men that it was not their job to do this for the young men. And David said, quote, I don't think I should have to do that with three of you in the house. Emily followed this with, quote, I think the most important thing is shopping. We aren't here to entertain you. We're here to support you. Interestingly here, Emily makes a distinction between support and entertain. Indeed, this was further elucidated as both Emily and David spoke adamantly about their view that their role was to support with instrumental tasks. They went as far as to say that entertaining, the entertaining they did for the young men wasn't actually part of their support work role, but rather something for which they gave up their own time. 
avoiding physical contact and moments of tenderness when boundaries were transgressed. During one of these food shopping trips that I've just mentioned, in which I accompanied the house on, um, as we were walking into the shopping centre, I saw that Joey, one of the young men living in the house, tried to take the hand of one of his support workers, Emily. But I observed how she quickly pulled her hand away from him without verbally acknowledging what had happened. Elsewhere, when spending time with Joey and Mark, his housemates, at the community farm where they worked on a voluntary basis to help them develop employment skills, I observed how they would both regularly attempt to engage in physical contact with their farm support workers, Jane and Samantha. Though I observed that Jane and Samantha would often make attempts to brush off these invitations of physical contact, similarly to how Emily did, um, there were occasions when the support workers responded to these invitations. And I asked Jane how she thought what she thought the best way to respond to it in these situations was. And she said that because, um, especially with someone like Mark, it was difficult because if you paid him too much attention, he would begin to, quote, play on this. She said it was difficult to achieve a balance between supporting his needs whilst not encouraging the, quote, attention-seeking behaviour. Yet there were times when I observed how support workers acknowledged the apparent emotional vulnerability of the people they supported and what appeared to be their need for, to feel connected to others. For example, during the house meeting that I have um, mentioned above, immediately as the meeting started, Mark, one of the, the young men with learning disabilities, was sitting on the sofa next to me. And um, as the meeting started, he leaned over towards me and put his head on my shoulder. In response to this, one of the support workers who was present, David, immediately asked him to stop saying, quote, not appropriate, mate. David then suddenly appeared to want to respond to Mark in some way, at least to uh, um, acknowledge his apparent need for security. As he then said in a very soft tone, quote, I know it's just that I know, chill. I know you're feeling nervy and want a bit of reassurance. The ethnographic material presented here, although brief, describes how people with learning disabilities and the staff supporting them experience their relationships with each other in professional social care settings. At Singer Tree Trust and, and through um, the house at um, Sander said View, I found that people with learning disabilities with whom I spent time overwhelmingly sought emotional connections with the people supporting them. Problematically, however, the kinds of support associated with these emotional responses, such as physical contact, are presented in policy and practice as overly paternalistic and as safeguarding risks. I saw how Singletary Trust staff often rejected these invitations, particularly regarding physical contact from people they supported. And when reflecting on this, staff would explain that they try to avoid engaging with people with um, they support in these ways so that the people didn't get the wrong idea. Um, as such, staff appear to often organise their care relationships around task-based activities. Despite this, though, as I've also shown, there were times when staff appear to be acutely aware of the vulnerability of people with learning disabilities, and these boundaries would be transgressed, allowing support workers to experience moments of emotional connectedness with the people they supported, such as engaging in hugs, holding hands, and offering words of reassurance. Yet there remained a sense still that staff felt awkward, even sometimes resentful about having this responsibility to be emotionally involved in people's lives. For instance, the statement, of, uh, the statement by support worker Emily describing how her role uh, is being there to support and not to, to entertain the, the young men. Rational approaches to shaping relations of support in social care are obviously necessary um, for the reasons outlined in um, Care Act legislation. But we must also we also need to consider the implications of relying so heavily on this and not enough on the importance of interpersonal human relationships between people in receipt of support and those supporting them. Ultimately, such rules can have the unintended consequence of depriving people who are receiving care from meaningful social connections in their lives. Um, it's important to be aware in this context, that for many people with learning disabilities who live in full-time support settings, staff can often be their primary, if not only, source of human con of daily human contact. And so, this type of if this type of encounter doesn't take place between people with learning disabilities and their support workers, it is unlikely to feature in the lives of people with learning disabilities over the long term. Yet, this also raises the question as to how 
or if these kinds of interactions can function in professional relationships where there is inherent and stark power imbalance between carer and caree, such as there is between people with learning disabilities and their support workers. Although Anne-Marie Moles call to let us let, let us instead let us care is a powerful one, we possibly might also need to acknowledge the real complexities and potential perils that come with these kinds of encounters. Thank you. Thank you, Caris, for your brilliant presentation. Well done, thanks. Um, I also want to say that uh, Professor Thielen uh, joined us. So welcome, Tatiana. Um, nice to see you here online. Um, we are going, uh, we are moving on to uh, Joanna Manusaki's presentation. Um, hello, Joanna, and welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I just started sharing video, but it seems that it doesn't want to do it. Uh, no worries. It's, uh, it's fine. We understand this kind of technical glitches. We can all, yeah. all hear you anyway. Perfect. So when you're ready, please. Yeah, um, and I'm really sorry for that. It's been the last few days, it's been horrible, um, but hopefully the sound will be okay. So, hello everyone. I am Ioanna, a PhD researcher in UCL Anthropology. Thank you all for being here and also a big thank you to the organizers and our discussant, as well as to all the contributors for their very well thought through papers, highlighting a number of ambivalences inherent in practices of care and caring. So I had included that due to low bandwidth, I will not be sharing a PowerPoint. I thought you would be able to see my face. So apologies for both, um, because I know how important visual cues can be for sensing a place. <clears throat> my presentation will also be slightly low on ethnography, highlighting instead a few key points on how care for border crossers became a form of transgression of biopolitical and physical borders in Greece, to raise further questions on the capacity and limits of care to counteract systemic violence, tackle exclusion, and become a vehicle for conviviality and integration for future discussion. I'm fairly new to the concept of care that I started looking at as a potential analytical lens to critically reflect on and compare various care logics for border crossers that developed in Greece after 2015, during but mostly after my PhD fieldwork. My initial research proposal focused on different care actors' understandings of human rights and how these affect the choice and design of care practices that subsequently enable or hinder recipient access to rights. However, I increasingly observed that caring for the other um, was often infused and motivated by cultural and personal understandings of care, mirroring how one would like to be cared for and as a form of care for the self and in that sense became a form of mutual care as well as a social duty that encompassed political organizing towards a more egalitarian society for all in the creation of mobile commons and organization of protests for social democratic and political rights. Even those that during my research advocated that rights discrimination and violations should be at the core of my writing, simultaneously worked on a volunteer basis in organizations offering medical and other forms of care to people without papers and some being refugees themselves, took pride in the quality of the care provision, of their care provision that entailed long conversations with patients and their families in their native language and visits to remote camps with limited access to healthcare. At the same time, humanitarian actors in Athens often aligned their precarious working conditions with the precarious violent nature of humanitarian care provision, understanding the two precarities as being deeply intertwined and thus having to be mutually addressed. When in the winter of 2019, some humanitarian social workers refused to sign eviction notices of recognized refugees from UNHCR funded apartments, they were subsequently made redundant and a number of humanitarian actors called for an open assembly to organize collective action against what they understood as dehumanizing and unethical policies that were very far from the duties of care they were supposed to perform. Hence, in the carescape, carescape for border crossers in Greece, now many becoming asylum seekers and recognized refugees, as the relocation program to Europe has ceased and borders have become increasingly harder to cross, 
care, violence, ethics, politics and rights find themselves in constant dialogue. Although humanitarianism and rights as two distinct bodies of literature have been problematized in recent years, I feel that the concept of care allows more flexibility to look at these different manifestations of care and caring, their enacted transgressions and refusals. At the same time, the enactment of care as a matter of everyday interaction in the form of affirmative micropolitics and affective transmissions that inject kindness allows us to understand the potential of care provision in social welfare and integration, enacting and at the same time generating a shift in values and as mentioned in one of the other papers in the panel, encompassing the power to harm as well as to nurture and empower, whilst entailing wider visions of a good society. Lately, I have been focusing more on the importance of affective transmissions that take place in everyday interactions, as many of my interlocutors, for failure of a better word, that have now moved to Northern Europe, often mention mundane experiences of care in Greece, for example, older people sharing their food with them, to delineate the experience of racism in the North, reproducing social distance instead of connection, albeit one that provides more social rights that they recognize and are grateful for. At the same time, spontaneous everyday acts of care, such as giving border crossers arriving to the islands a ride in one's car to the closest registration center when crossing them walking long distances under the scorching sun, have been deemed transgressive by the border regime and have been subsequently, subsequently criminalized, disrupting the flow of social encounters and connections generated between citizens and border crossers through spontaneous, habitual, or collectively organized acts and practices of care. The latter separation from socially caring parts of society was necessary to normalize their physical enclosure within camps, followed by their gradual construction as bi biopolitical others, inferior, contaminating, unwanted, perishable, illegal, threatening, deportable, people not deserving rights. In my longer paper for the panel, I tried to draw a short genealogy of a bottom-up care logic that developed in Greece during the economic crisis as a result of a transgression of the social contract by the state that pushed a large part of the population towards the poverty line through repeated austerity policies that left many unemployed and without access to free public health care. After a number of months of continuous protests at Athens Constitution Square against antisocial bailout packages, many protesters reinvested their energy in self-organized solidarity initiatives springing up across the country, ranging from free social clinics and pharmacies to social kitchens, exchange free shops, barter markets and time banks. Apart from providing a space of sociality and, and collective agency where people felt useful and connected, Horizontally organized crisis solidarity care networks operated under a logic of non-exclusionary care. They were open to all those being dispossessed from basic welfare rights, irrespective of legal status or ethnicity. By transgressing the citizenship binary that became increasingly relevant during the crisis, they have been subsequently analyzed as care practices promoting a lateral form of active social citizenship through bilateral modes of material and affective exchange entailing healing capacities in their potential to transform relationships between caregivers and seekers, mending the fractured socio-political body under austerity through intersubjective reciprocity. This reciprocal understanding of care was transported to care initiatives for border crossers, developing in the aftermath of the long summer of migration. Beyond care being perceived as a right in itself, Care provision in the newly opened refugee squad Notara 26 was also actively supporting the right to free movement, providing care for people on the move on their way to Northern Europe through the Balkan route. Adopting a model of collective decision-making, it also proposed a vision for social integration. In its opening statement, migrant solidarity stood antithetically to the bordering regime and the production of exploitable biopolitical difference as border crossers were not perceived as other, but rather as being othered by the status quo that profited from the migrant refugee flow and the emergence of cheap labor. Where the ter territorialization of solidarity towards refugees and immigrants aimed to cover their immediate needs of shelter, food me and medical help, but also included the intention to build a common future together by working and living side by side. 
I'm aware that I'm probably coming at the end of my time and have not explicitly touched on the issue of transgression. So I will bring three key examples. In Otara, meeting people's basic needs was a political prerequisite for supporting their ability to move across borders. However, it was the mutually shared pleasure of meeting people's desires, of finding a piece of clothing that they liked, or playing games together, that made this encounter meaningful, framing care as a form of repair, transgressing experiences of ongoing violence, theirs and ours, through shared moments of joy. In the context of the makeshift camp in Idomeni, in the Greek-Macedonian border, Solidarians equally modeled their care provision in a dialectical relation to people's needs and desires, including involving border crossers in the cooking process to cater for the culinary preferences of the community and providing care in quantities and ways that would enable, rather than inhibit, people to gather food provisions and have time to plan crossing the borders over the mountains. In addition to material support in the form of bags, including shoes, maps, and SIM cards that facilitated long journeys. Lastly, I will refer to my experience of working as an art facilitator for underage asylum seekers for an international NGO at a border island. That was in 2017. The art workshops, designed as creative therapeutic spaces intending to enhance sociality and collective empowerment amongst teenagers of different nationalities that were being racist against each other, attempted to transgress racial discrimination. Their successful running was itself a result of a line of transgressions, starting with the humanitarian prohibition of touching, as we often started the sessions by holding hands in a circle. It was followed by the state-appointed head psychologist's decision to allow unaccompanied minors to join the workshops by themselves, bypassing the legal requirements of having a guardian present when a change of responsibility from the Ministry of Interior Affairs to the new Ministry of Migration left first reception, the Greek state authority, understaffed and unable to appoint someone. Another humanitarian transgression was inviting the volunteer interpreters who lived in the camp to my flat to translate the artworks after the workshops. <clears throat> I was advised against spending time alone with them and to work in a cafeteria instead, since the NGO offices were closed at that time. Apart from being impossible to translate in a noisy environment, it felt unethical to have the participants intimate work in public view without their permission and discriminatory towards the people interpreting that were providing an unpaid service. I decided to treat them as collaborators instead of humanitarian subjects and we ended up spending many evenings sharing food and working in my kitchen. So as a conclusion, um, referring to the project, it ended up being successful First of all, being able to run it was based on a number of transgressions, otherwise it would have been practically impossible. Um, but then it was through these transgressions, it was also successful in transgressing racism in more ways than it originally, originally envisioned. By transgressing, transgressing the inherent humanitarian separation, it ultimately blurred lines of care provider and recipient and during the three-day exhibition of participants' work of host and hosted. Reciprocal relationships that developed in these temporal care spaces, infused by what I culturally interpret as solidarity, have spatially extended to Athens, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and the UK, and remain latently active. Equally, relationships that developed between border crossers and solidarians in Idomeni and in self-organized squads in Athens have been reactivated when the former ended up being on the move again. By putting down personal time and tapping into networks and associations dedicated to supporting people in the Balkan route that exist throughout Europe, Solidarians have supported them to safely reunite with their family or to apply for asylum and continue their studies in a country of their choice, bypassing smugglers and bordering restrictions. And I think I'm gonna leave it at that and then allow more time for discussion. Thank you so much, Joanna. Great presentation. Um, we will talk later more. Um, we are gonna now play um, 
Siak van der Geest uh, video, we passed it to, to Dan. So if you can please uh, take care of it, it would be really great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, I'm presenting our paper on care tyranny. Um, <clears throat> my co-author is Coleta Platenkamp. She is a sociologist and she um, uh, made built a website which contains uh, more than 5,000 books by people who tell and share with the readers um, experiences they had in care and, 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 and sickness. And that website is, has been helpful also in writing this essay. I myself, I'm an, uh, <clears throat> an, a retired professor of medical anthropology at the University of Amsterdam. Um, the, the, this shows the, the main idea of our uh, paper, um, you know, crossing uh, lines of boundaries of privacy is normal and acceptable if, um, you, if you need help. So for patients, um, they should allow other people to to come closer to them and helping them in basic activities of life, like uh, taking a bath or going to the toilet of eating or dressing. And so that's acceptable. But in our paper, we focus on tr so-called transgressions, which are not acceptable and which are not welcomed by patients in care situations. So we pick out uh, examples of what we call a tyrannic way of uh, giving care. Uh, the sources of our paper are very uh, diverse. Um, <clears throat> are <clears throat> the, uh, as you can see, literature, films, ethnographic observations, and so-called ego documents. That is what we found on the website that I mentioned just a minute ago. Uh, this is a quote from someone in a nursing home. And so you, you can read it. Uh, so the, the patient asks, can I have the towel, please? And then he, he gets the answer from the nurse, uh, I'm not your boy. So uh, she is kind of irritated and around nine, uh, 9.30, he, uh, he needs her. So he, he uh, rings the bell and she, she shows up at 11 o'clock. Um, and then, uh, you know, she says, put off the bell and, sa and says, you are disturbing. We are drinking coffee. So then he says, in, if you are completely dependent on someone else, that other person will eventually hit you. It's a very uh, sarcastic and, and, and bitter um, observation. So this is what I tried. We tried to uh, present to you in this short uh, video presentation. So about care harassment, tyranny in film and literature, in uh, in ethnographic uh, work by anthropologists, medical anthropologists, ego documents, so reports of people who have been sick themselves and have been cared for either in an institution or in a home situation. And uh, some concluding uh, reverse care, sorry, reverse care tyranny. I will explain that later on and on our uh, conclusion. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have uh, seen the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I don't think I have to, uh, to tell the story again. Actually, there's no time for that now. But uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, dramatic example of a tyranny by the head nurse of a mental hospital where patients are who come who revolt against her regime and it ends terrible with uh, one patient committing suicide another patient being operated and uh, in uh, having a brain operation and turning into a vegetable as we uh, call that 
and that per, that patient that p- person is um, killed by another patient to to save him from the suffering and, and, and from his condition. Uh, Janet Frame is, is a New Zealand uh, person. She wrote an autobiographical novel, Faces in the Water, in which she describes her stay of about eight years in a mental hospital where she received more than 2,000 electric shocks. And those shocks uh, in, in, the, in the 1950s are really terrible experiences. It's an incredible story, um, which you know presents many examples of the, what we call um, care tyranny. Then there is the um, TV series of the singing detective. I'm sure some of you know it. It's about an, uh, a patient in, in the, also in the hospital, and uh, the main um, complaint of this man about his the way he is being treated is that they treat him like a child, so infantilization, uh, which is I think a common phenomenon. And uh, so then in a monologue or an internal, uh, uh, no, in internal, internal, uh, who shall I say? It? <laughs> um, anyway, he thinks uh, loud up, why is it when you lose your health, the entire medical profession takes it as axioma- axiomatic you, that you have lost also your mind. Ethnographic observations. Uh, Jukas and her co authors uh, describe how nurses, midwives in a uh, uh, maternity clinic, treat uh, women that are delivering a child. Um, <clears throat> rudeness, inhumane treatment, sarcasm by the, by the, uh, the midwife. Um, <clears throat> so they treated them treat them like children and show no care whatsoever. (laughs) So the ego documents also talk about rude language, um, also lack of of physical care. So uh, there is the example of an old lady who has terrible bed sores and it seems that the nurses didn't pay attention to it very much. Also misusing the the dependency of the patient by uh, doing some nasty things like putting the TV control before they go go to sleep, putting the TV uh, remote control out of reach so that they cannot, uh, yeah cannot watch the television if they want to uh, to do so. Uh, they also uh, unreasonable sticking to protocols. I mean, sometimes uh, relatives come and try to do certain things which the nurses don't allow because it's not allowed by the protocol. But on the other hand, there is also work pressure by the uh, on the part of the nurses, which we should also take into uh, account. Um, Reverse care tyranny, that's we mean by that, that not the caregiver, but the care receiver behaves like a tyranny and is claiming uh, permanent attention from from caregivers like children of, of, of a spouse. And uh, here is a quote that uh, some children say, our dad was a very good person, but difficult. He claimed us completely. We always had to be at his service. So that's reverse tyranny. And the children find themselves in a very um, contradictory uh, situation because on the one hand, they are angry and frustrated. And on the other hand, they are feeling guilty for perhaps not responding sufficiently to what the old man or the old lady expects from them. My concluding remarks, our concluding remarks, is that that type of care tyranny um, occurs everywhere, not only in hospitals and and, and, and clinics, but also uh, in home situations or maybe in schools or anywhere. Um, 
And um, we also say something about reciprocity. You know, if if children take care of their parents, they do so. Part mainly also because they know that when they were small, young children and needed help and care of their parents, they receive that care. And now that their parents need help, they do so um, to uh, to help them. So that is reciprocity. But that type of reciprocity is, of course, absent in a professional uh, situation where patients are in hospital or or in care institution and, and and cared for by people with whom they have no other previous uh, uh, links and relationships. There is also short-term reciprocity, by which I mean and that um, uh, when you meet someone in the hospital who is very dependent and perhaps forgetful, um, the reciprocity that that exists in a normal conversation is absent. So you talk to, to your mother and your mother does not respond. She only asks you, who, what is the time? What is the time? And so the visit becomes uh, an, an obligatory uh, charity, but you, you, it's, there's no pleasure in visiting uh, her. And, and that may also play a role in, um, in, in, in care going wrong. Dependency leads to power inequality or may lead to power in inequality. I, uh, you, uh, I remind you of the sentence in the, in the second uh, slide. Um, then one-sided sources. Um, our uh, data, if we may call them so, are... Um, mainly almost entirely from for coming from patients and their relatives and not from the caregivers if they would hear if if we would hear their version of the story we may be uh, have a different opinion and finally i should um, uh, not finally but i should also point out that our methodology and our data is a, not a conventional way of, 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 of writing uh, anthropology. Now we, as it were, as it were, cherry-picked uh, texts and, 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 and moments in films, etc., that express, that show that tyranny. And not because we want, and the conclusion that we draw from it is, of course, not that we uh, can prove or uh, argue that this is a very common phenomenon. We only were curious uh, how this is presented in various uh, media uh, to draw attention to uh, to this phenomenon, but uh, that's all. So it, this is a very exploratory uh, research of different types of data. Finally, um, I want to return to that uh, example of midwives in Africa you know, uh, maltreating verbal and even physical violence to, um, to delivering mothers. Um, in another article, uh, which you is referred to in the paper, um, a Ugandan midwife is uh, interviewed and she explains to the anthropologist that, that she is rough to the pa to the pa to the woman to the women um, but she does so because she wants to help them and she wants to make sure that the baby is well and if she is too soft and 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 too sympathetic to them, they may relax, and as a result, the, the delivery may not go well. So this idea puts the um, idea of care tyranny in a quite different perspective. I think I must stop here. Thank you for listening. Ten minutes is uh, is a very short period, as we all. Uh, will realize today. 
but um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I cannot take part in a discussion, but I wish you a very good and an instructive continuation of the meeting and thank you for your attention. Um, thanks to Siak and thanks to Daniel to, to play the video. Uh, I think I'm gonna give space to Tatiana Thielen for a round of comment. Um, yeah, looking forward to hear them. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, I would like to, to thank you uh, for inviting me to this interesting uh, workshop. And I have to apologize that I came late. I hope that I don't have to leave early as well. But um, yeah, so here I am, and I read all the papers. So maybe I refer to something that was in the written things and not stated now. But uh, anyhow, I think we will have a little bit of time of discussion. Um, so what I'm trying to do is to draw from the papers specific kinds of transgressions and the kinds of rules um, and, and the kind of idea of care that um, is um, expressed there. I will make a very short uh, uh, comment to uh, Jacques van der Heest, who has just, uh, and, and his colleague Platenkamp, who cannot miss us and therefore not discuss. As you have seen in the video, they have this interesting collection, and he referred to that uh, in the very end. And this specifically would also be my question, I guess, to them. So what is the status of these different sources? What are so? Is there something more general in this care tyranny, as they uh, term it, and how they would, you know, further explicate? No, they are not with us, so they can't do so. So I leave it uh, for that paper for the moment. With that, um, and I will then now turn with my comments to Julia Scurley to the unruly care paper, uh, where she presents um, as. By the way, um, Platenkamp and Van der Kest also do um, transgressions from both sides. And, and there is this very, I would say, very welcome um, um, stress in, the, in, in this last uh, paper on unpleasant situations of care and all this ambivalence. So here in the paper by Julia, there also are rule transgressions from both sides, so the patient as the care receiver and the clinic personnel as care givers. Um, and this rule bending, at least as far as I read the paper, seems rather kind of counterproductive uh, in this environment because it doesn't improve um, the health um, situation. Um, so what I think in a further elaboration of the paper, it might be worthwhile to go beyond the internal discussions and evaluations between the staff and differentiate the diverse traversings that occurred in both the um, individual cases that she presents. So first, um, there seems to be a boundary crossing between family and state or slash personal in the clinic through allowing the mother into the clinic space. And in the second case, by making the clinic actually the family of the patient or perceiving themselves as being the, the family. And almost counterintuitively, um, when the staff interpreted themselves actually as the patient's only family, that prompted yet another transgression, um, including her into the realm of the public professional. So I think this kind of um, uh, sequence and, and complementary movement could be, um, could be analyzed maybe in more detail. Another boundary transgression um, concerned the inside and the outside of the body. So uh, Maya, the second case, explicitly asked for some transgressive acts of, of care by staff that could be seen as questioning her bodily integrity, like the searches inside her mouth. Um, and thirdly, um, implicitly, and of course all interconnected, uh, and most crucial, I think, um, is the boundary between life and death. So the inability uh, for the personnel to prevent harm and death, so uh, eventually, um, seems to call into question the, the ultimate goals these professionals um, have. Um, so partly it seems to me that all these investments into drawing the boundaries aimed at avoiding um, transgressing this 
ultimate boundary in a way. So, and that is um, uh, becoming implicated in the death of a patient. And, and and I think there is something why it is so urgent to um, to to these um, actors to to draw uh, boundaries or to transgress them. Um, and in the paper, uh, and I'm now turning to, to the paper um, on learning disabilities. Um, here we have um, rather the care receivers who transgress the rules, uh, try to go beyond um, the boundaries. And these transgressions seems rather ineffective because the professionals very, very hard try very hard, um, and, and the anthropologist herself does, to, to keep within in the rules, so to not let the transgression occur. And this has, and this I think is a very important argument in this paper, has unintended consequences um, of leaving, or potentially um, a consequence of leaving the clients lonely and socially disconnected. Um, what we can see here, similar to the previous paper, that there might be a kind of a more general um, underlying um, cultural ideas, or here it is more spelled out uh, than in the previous, that the autonomous individual and her private sphere um, is pursued through the rules that shape then the boundaries between the public and the private. Um, within that frame, um, the bodily and emotional needs are placed outside the sphere of the public care. Um, and that is how then these, uh, these unintended consequences can occur. But still, as we see, actually, um, the public carer transgresses the boundary on a daily basis. So, so, the, so actually, the, the, the boundary between the, the public and the private is then drawn within the private house, where it is then done by differentiating um, the needs. So household and hygiene are considered of public interest in a way that the public carer can deal with it, whereas leisure and, and fun and so forth, so hug, huggings are placed to private. So the boundary is already within the house, but it's, it's set at a different um, point, so to say. Um, and this then creates the tension of the equally important uh, value of equality. So, and the latter becomes the uh, unfulfilled promise, which probably explains um, the ascription of the role of a kind of a trickster to the anthropologist who in her professional capacity of a researcher, but not paid to care, seems to be suitable to fill at least some of these needs, which the, the publicly paid or state paid carers um, um, don't feel they, 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 they have a right to, to fulfill. And interestingly enough, um, and I'm, I'm mentioning this because this is reoccurring then in the in the um, paper on the great activists, is that bound um, the money is is marking this boundary. So only who is not paid for care is allowed to intuit what in whatever given situation is um, defined as private, and in this case, it's to offer fun or you know bodily um, proximity. Um, and this offers, I think, a glimpse into uh, another ambivalent uh, quality of care and a very um, an underlying, not mentioned uh, dimension um, that, um, all, all, um, so, and, and it's about, um, so when is care authentic? And it's only authentic if it's not paid for. And this marks then what is appropriate for family, kin, and, and not for the others. Um, so what I, what I think is really useful to draw out and which is already there in the paper uh, is that although care is often used as a conceptual tool to ask for more impartial policies, and this will be a recurrent topic in the next, um, in the Greek paper, the actual care practice is often rather the opposite. So maybe, you know, uh, the anthropologist or the, the public carers don't like everybody the same in this. Um, in, in this unit. So maybe giving some care would then be authentic, but not impartial. And, and I think there is something where one can think about how care is, um, is um, often perceived so positive, but is actually rather um, ambivalent. 
Uh, and here I turn to the last paper in this session, the, the Greek activists, and uh, where we can see exactly what I was hinting to at now, the, where care is attributed a positive value and transgression is also meant to be positive. And we can maybe in the last session then talk a little bit more about uh, the concept of transgression as well. So it's used here, care is used here as a concept of critique, a critique of neoliberal and austerity policies, uh, restrictive citizenship rules, and humanitarian forms of government. So the activists seek to provide care for and with refugees, aiming at what I just mentioned before, more inclusive ethics um, by transgressing various rules. Um, Notably, the acts of care involve similar motives as uh, the provisioning of care for the persons with learning disabilities in the UK. And, and this is not explicitly there, but uh, one can draw these similarities, um, namely that care should not simply be given, but instead a mutual input is expected. So there is this reciprocal um, thing. So passivity on the end of the care receivers is rejected and this is uh, and this is then of nature lies so i'm not doing you know your shopping you have to come with me um i'm not running uh, the the shelter here but you should be involved in the politics of, of running it um, another similarity to to the to the um, to the uk paper is the rejection and general critique of monetarization of care um, I, as i mentioned um, and this uh, i think is 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 a hint to this broader motives because we find it a recurrent topic also in other policy debates in debates about is should it be um, uh, allowed uh, that relatives uh, can be care uh, can be paid for by state money um, some European uh, uh, countries allow for that others do not and behind this again are these ideas um, or more general cultural ideas, concepts about authentic um, care, which is only pure enough to be authentic if it is not paid for. Um, usually what such conceptualizations do is to naturalize kinship and or community. And this might be uh, or might provide a starting point to reflect further upon the policies of solidarity in, uh, in Greece as well. And I stop here. So I hope we have some, some room for discussion, although the time is over, as I can see. Thank you very much for, for, for your, all your wonderful papers, by the way. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, for sharing your comments and thoughts on the paper. Um, I would ask the presenters if they want to add any I don't know, further comments or share their thoughts on them. And of course, uh, questions from the audience are more than welcome. Otherwise, Ahmad and I will try to ask questions, but yeah, let's give priority to others. Um, Terry, Joanna, Julia, would you like to add anything? Happy to say something if unless anyone has questions. That um, so thank you so much for your for your comments and yeah they're really really helpful and um, I think they really touch on um, the topics that I actually explore in, in my thesis. So this is like an extra bit that I hadn't really incorporated in my thesis. But uh, uh, so I'm glad that these things can be felt through the through the paper. And uh, in, in particular, the, the boundary between the professionals and the family carers, which is really complicated, is um, uh, the, the theme of one of my chapters that is really about the difficult work of um, uh, dealing with the boundaries between professional care and family care. And the interesting thing of this place is that the very explicit aim of treatment is that the treatment team is supposed to mimic and borrow the tools of family care, but cleaned of the dysfunctionality of the patients, like real family, to, um, uh, to heal the patient. And so the difficult bit is that they have to use the tools of kinship care, but without being ending up entangled in the in the problematic aspects of kinship care and we see like in the last case in Maya's case that that is exactly what happens and what um, makes professionals um, uh, come up to the point that they feel the need to delegate the care to another 
to another treatment team and it was really um, telling um, like one of the comments that one of the professionals made at some point where, while reflecting on this and they were saying, yeah, like the, this other treatment team where we are sending Maya, it's like a salvation for us. And it's in the same way that we usually are a salvation for patients' parents who can't impose the rules of treatment on, on their own daughters. So it, there was really this, this kind of um, uh, identification and, and switching of roles, which is really interesting. And, and then the, um, I'm being, uh, I'm just adding one more thing so that I can leave space, space to others. The boundary between um, life and death is, um, is exactly what, uh, what makes all these other boundary transgressions um, complicated and, 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 and that makes them emerge. And, and this, it is the urgency of, I think it's very interesting that it's the urgency of the physiological body here that requires professionals to be really alert to, to the problems of this boundary transgression that they, it needs to happen like daily in their work, but it needs to be con constantly monitored and constantly kept under check so that uh, that ultimate boundary is not, is not crossed uh, because it would result in patient dying. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, thanks so much also for the other comments. Um, and um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any other question if anyone has. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, Caris or Joanna, do you want to add anything? I mean, feel free to not to, of course. Um, I was just, I mean, it would be great to hear if anyone um, present has any other questions, but um, just to say thank you, um, Tatiana, that's um, really, really helpful. And I really um, appreciate the comments you gave around, just picking up on um, Julia's comments around boundaries and um so you kind of distinguish between boundaries in the house so um the kind of entertaining and then um a public boundary so private and public and public is about kind of shopping so that's an interesting way to kind of frame those those ideas that I think I can um, try and take forward um in the manuscript I'm developing from this um and how there's an attempt I suppose um to contain people and relationships within those boundaries but as you said um, and we can see in the other papers as well though those attempts are often um, they don't work or you know they often don't work and um, then there can be fallouts from that um, or or messiness in people's lives um, that's um, not acknowledged in policy not acknowledged in rules and that has implications for um, people's relationships with each other. Thanks, Gary. Um, any um, any comments from Joanna? So we have um, a raised the hands uh, in the chat. So then go ahead. Okay, no, you can go first, and then we'll gather questions from from the audience. Joanna, please go on. Um, okay, so in the presentation, I kind of moved a bit to another side that I didn't include in the written paper, which is how humanitarians um, perceive their work, so paid humanitarians, which also felt that these boundaries did not allow them to provide care. Um, mm -hmm. But then also they felt that they couldn't be politically active within their space of work, hence they had to go around it and, and organize the assemblies and ask for social help um, to support them in their struggle to, to provide better care. Um, so it made me think also reading the other papers, how these cultural ideas of community beyond um, the Greek crisis and how that created relational ties with uh, other uh, dispossessed members of society that were not necessarily national or, or kinship ties, but how possibly these notions of, of care that are connected to, to community are so embedded and invested in, in, in um, Greek understandings of provision, of care provision, 
because a lot of, of humanitarians, which I have to say, were not trained to be humanitarian, so they did not have the training that, that the actors described in the other papers had. They were mostly unemployed social scientists that found work, paid work, um, through um, the humanitarian business, still felt that these boundaries did not allow them to provide the care that they felt they should. Um, so I think that there might be wider cultural understandings of care, which in some sense may be possibly also aligned with a lot of border crossers understandings of care. And then this discussion also made me think how Greece having a generally limited state in terms of care provision, um, which is mirrored in a lot of the places where people were coming from, created similar understandings of what care is, which is very much infused in these in this small moments of, of affectiveness that make people feel that they belong, that have stayed so much in people's experiences that then they're re reiterated once they're away from Greece. So, yeah, I think reading all the papers together and, and Tatiana's comments about authenticity and kinship made me rethink of how understandings of what care is and how a person feels cared for are often very much connected to um, previous experiences and, and cultural um, and also state relationships to care. Uh, thanks, Johanna. Uh, and I would add a lot on what you just said, but I will uh, refrain myself from doing that in this context. Uh, so uh, we'll, um, we'll, we would ask uh, Simon, uh, if I pronounce your name correctly, to just go and ask, uh, go on with your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm very grateful for this panel and for the papers. They've been deeply um, insightful, and I've really enjoyed listening to it all. Um, my question is specifically addressed to Karis, um, and it's about the dynamics in the domiciliary care that you, you studied. And I was very curious because it seemed to me that all of these um, contestation about boundaries were actually taking place along gendered lines because the uh, the residents of the home were uh, men and the people who they seemed to be seeking affection from were women. And it seemed to me that the reason why it was seen as particularly improper was because they were the residents were seen as seeking an improper form of maternal or even romantic affection from these caregivers. Um, and I was, I suppose I found it a slightly curious omission from the analysis because it seemed to me to be really crucial. This is what I think the residents were being charged with doing. It was uh, some sort of really improper practice. And it called to my mind also the professionalization of the care sector in the UK because a lot of what we've been discussing has been about how the caregivers are seen as professionals and seek to uphold professional boundaries. But at least from my perspective, I see the prof I see the care sector in the UK is markedly unprofessionalized insofar as labor is casualized, insofar as actually the training of the qualifications necessary to enter the industry are actually quite low and quite limited. And actually, it's somewhat of a free for all, we could say, to work in the care sector in a lot of ways, at least at that level of domiciliary care. So I was curious, the reason why I say this is because it strikes me then that there are actually limited opportunities for people who start to work in the sector to become professionalized insofar as the pedagogy and the training and the qualifications. So I suppose what I'm trying to say on this point is, to what extent are the caregivers really professionals or are we perhaps overstating the professionalization and the authority of their status? That is to say, are we taking their claims at face value when actually maybe they aren't seen as having the same kind of um, professional authority as you could say doctors or teachers or so on? Um, particularly because it seemed to me that perhaps it's, it would be interesting to see when these boundaries are followed and when they're not followed, because I'm, I'm sure that there are many instances when they aren't followed, perhaps not in your case, but perhaps in others. Um, 
I, I'll leave it there because I, I could go on forever because of the resemblances between our field sites. But I just wanted to thank you again for such an insightful um, paper and insightful ethnography. Thanks, Simon. Um, shall I respond now? Yeah. Um, thanks. I know, really interesting points there. Um, so just on the first one about um, kind of boundaries along gendered lines. Um, so there was one support worker I mentioned in um, at Sunset View who was a male, David. Um, it, can be a bit difficult I think to follow the um support workers and um who's there but um yeah I mean in my uh, PhD thesis I do um touch on the idea of that kind of um the idea of people with learning disabilities I, I mentioned it um in the paper briefly getting the wrong idea so that was spoken about a bit um and you are I think you are right in saying that there was a kind of a gendered element to it in that um there was a concern, particularly young men might be seeking, like, as you said, in, improper relationships with carers, particularly the women who are the, who make up the majority of um, the support worker workforce. Um, I, there is an element of that, but there was also, um, I think, a more general element, about, and that's what I've tried to encapsulate in the term kind of emotional connections of just wanting to feel close to somebody else, um, another human being. And um, perhaps in some encounters that was it was sexualized, but in others it may uh, it may have been kind of mis that that the intentions could be misconstrued as being sexual, and actually they weren't. They're just about kind of that wanting to feel emotionally close. So I think um, in answer to your question, I think yes, in some element aspects of it is a, um, a a sexualized element to it, but in others not. And actually, we also see this. Um, in relationships between people with learning disabilities and social care support settings. So I don't know um, if you found in your research, it would be interesting to perhaps at a later date to hear more about what you've done, um, that um, there can often be allegations made by one person with learning disabilities against another person with learning disabilities. So for example, they she touched my breast or something like that. And um, where um, I think sometimes that they can get the intention behind those things can be misconstrued or be elaborated, and and because of the need the need to safeguard and protect, then um, kind of formal processes then get put in place about you know having to kind of in, uh, formal investigations. When um, I'm not quite sure whether all of the time that there was kind of a sexualized intent behind that. Um, but quick, just moving on to your next point um, about really interesting one about kind of the unprofessionalized how the labor in the uk is very unprofessionalized and so there's limited opportunities for people to become professionalized and therefore are we overstating this professional status of carers yeah i i think you you're onto something there and um um the training for um, support staff is is very limited we're asking them to do an awful lot um, engage in very complex um, relationships with with very vulnerable people um, from my experience, I think that um, there's still this implicit sense that they expectation that they actually just do that, get on with those complex relationships and do them. Um, and that's where we see the problems, you know, we can find in ethnographic accounts of, of there in the problem lies that um, actually support workers aren't being supported, trained or guided to navigate these very complex relationships, but they're actually just being left to get on with them. Um, so um, uh, that's something that maybe I'll, I'll kind of leave open um, to the to the group if anyone else has any comments on that. But thank you very much, Simon. Really, really helpful points raised there. So uh, thanks. I guess we are running out of time. So we're going to have a 30 minutes um, break. And we hope to see you all in the during the second session. And thanks again to the presenters and to Tatiana for her comments. And yeah, uh, we'll see you later online. And enjoy your break. Um, yeah, I guess that's all. <laughs> see you later. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Good to see you. And yeah. yeah. See you in a bit. S
see you. See you. Yeah. yeah. See you. There was just one comment from Caroline. We will. We can. We can discuss it like afterwards. I just took the uh, screenshots. Okay. And brilliant. then we can read it uh, later. Yes, Caroline, because it's uh, yeah we're running out of time, so have a break. Thank you. Yeah. See you soon. See you.